sprawled across 150 acres, about the size of 90 football fields, I'm at the National Memorial Arboretum in Staffordshire. I served almost 12 years in the British Army and found the Arboretum a special place to pay my tribute to all who have served our country. Walking through the well-kept grounds at the far east end of the Arboretum, where the sun rises, I came across the shot at Dawn Memorial. The 10-foot-high figure is modelled on Private Herbert Burden, who was executed for desertion at age 17. Six bushes represent the soldiers who were ordered to carry out the executions. A semicircle of stakes around the statue follows the seating pattern of a Greek theatre to symbolise tragedy. During the First World War, 306 British and Commonwealth soldiers were executed for cowardice, striking a senior officer, disobeying a lawful order, casting away arms or sleeping at their post. Private Herbert Morris, 6th Battalion, British West Indies Regiment, shot at dawn, 20th of September 1917, was aged 17 years old. To learn more about the execution of these young soldiers, we travelled to Poparinga, Belgium, with the British West India Regiment's Heritage Trust. Poparinga Market Square has mostly stayed the same since the First World War. In 1915, the town hall became the headquarters of the British Army. As the battle raged across the Western Front, some soldiers didn't return to the trenches, with many suffering from shell shock. Senior British officers sought to set a precedent by taking action. There is a serious prevalence of desertion to avoid duty in the trenches, especially in the 8th Brigade, and I'm sure that the only way to stop it is to carry out some death sentences. Court martials followed. Abraham Bevenstein, who was 17, wrote to his mother while awaiting trial for desertion. Dear mother, we were in the trenches and I was ill, so I went out and they took me and put me in prison and I'm in a bit of trouble now, and I won't get any money for a long time. I'll have to go in front of a court. I will try my best to get out of it. But dear mother, try to send me some money. I will let you know in my next letter how I get on. Give my best love to father and calf. Your loving son, A.B. Behind the Popperinga Town Hall, tucked away in a cobbled courtyard, is a place where some British and Canadian soldiers were executed. I entered one of the eight-foot cells that overlooks the courtyard. This is where they spent their last night, in here. Maybe writing a letter, um, I don't know, praying. One can only wonder what was going through their minds. Look at this, look at the walls. They've, they've inscribed their last messages, and they're all over the place. It's frightening, isn't it? It is frightening, mate, yeah. You can't imagine, you, you, you sign up for king and country or empire to do your bit in the Great War, and, and you're slotted because, what, shell shock? I wear hearing aids, I'm artillery, I know it's like on the gun position, it's loud. But gun after gun after round after round, it's going to drive people insane. It was the sound of the guns that made young Herbert Morris flee the trenches. But what do we know about Private Herbert Morris? Recruitment posters were used at the beginning of World War I to encourage people of the British Empire to volunteer for war service. 16-year-old Herbert Morris signed up to serve with 6th Battalion, the British West Indies Regiment. A training camp was set up at Seaford, East Sussex, to accommodate the men arriving from the West Indies. Deployed to the Western Front, Herbert's battalion was serving a battery of guns when it often encountered heavy shelling. 
Private Herbert Morris went absent for a second time. With no warrant of leave, he tried to enter a rest camp in Boulogne. Herbert was arrested and brought back to Poparinga to stand trial. He got tried for desertion on September the 7th, 1917, at a court-martial likely held above the cells. The charge was read out. When on active service, deserting His Majesty's services, in that he, Private Herbert Morris, in the field on the 20th of August, 1917, when warned for duty in the neighborhood of the front line, absented himself from his detachment until apprehended by the military police at Boulogne on the 21st of August, 1917. Morris pleaded to the court. I'm troubled with my head and I cannot stand the sound of guns. I report you to the doctor and he gave me no medicine or anything. Two officers gave character references. Lieutenant Andrews addressed the court. The accused has never given me any trouble. He is well behaved. I've known the accused for six months. His intelligence is higher than the ordinary man in my platoon. Private Herbert Morris was found guilty and sentenced to death. Field Marshal Haig confirmed his sentence. At 6.10 a.m. on September the 20th, he was taken outside into the courtyard Fire! and shot by a firing squad that comprised of seven West Indians and two white soldiers. They were kind of slightly uh, drugged, um, morphine or, or alcohol, brought out. They had a, a piece of cloth placed on their heart and guys from their own regiment lined up. Uh, some had blank ammunition, some had live rounds and they shot them. Shot them here, they were wrapped in a tarpaulin or, or a, a poncho and quickly taken away and buried. How brutal, how brutal is that? Nineteenth of July, nineteen nineteen, the Victory Parade. Fifteen thousand Allied troops marched through London. An estimated five million people lined the route to cheer the troops on. The Victory Parade was a spectacle unlike any other. The central parts of London hosted performances to entertain the jubilant crowds. But what of the families of the executed soldiers? Gertrude Farr, the wife of executed soldier Private Harry Farr, went to her local post office and was told, We don't give pensions to the wives of cowards. Gertrude was left destitute and homeless with a three-year-old and a four-month-old baby to feed. The Houses of Parliament the home of our democracy and admired around the world. Britain was one of the last countries to withhold pardons for all the 306 soldiers who were shot at dawn. In 1992, Harry Farr's widow campaigned to clear his name. John Major argued in the House of Commons that pardoning the men would be an insult to all those who died honourably on the battlefield and that everyone was tried fairly. Finally, in 2006, the Labour Defence Secretary of State, Des Brown, offered a blanket pardon for the 306 soldiers who were shot at dawn. Beneath the stars, in the cold of night, they stood in silence, ready to fight. With hearts of courage, they faced the moon, their bravery shining, though fate was sworn. In the trenches deep, where they once stood, their memory lingers, like a silent wood 
for Harry Farr and Herbert Burden too. Their courage shines forever true. We find our light guiding us through the darkest night.